Hello and welcome to the Super Nintendo Unscripted Podcast. My name is Nick and this is episode 13. Uh, if you are new here, uh, this is a podcast where I kind of just talk about any topic that I want to talk about um, without having to script it out. So basically I take it like an outline and just talk about whatever I want for about 45 minutes to an hour. Uh, so if you are new here and you do like that type of content, um, stick around, hit the like button on the YouTube if you're looking if you're watching on YouTube, and subscribe if you're new. Uh, if you are interested in the audio only version of this podcast, you're in luck because the show is now officially on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. I had been uploading it to Spotify, but I kind of just like fell off. So I took the entire day and I just put it up there for everybody to see or listen to actually, if you should, um, from that end. So if you are a person who likes to consume a podcast on Spotify or Apple podcasts, uh, go ahead. There will be links in the description, uh, where you can follow the episode. And, uh, if you really like the series and you're on those platforms be sure to give it a good rating if you are um enjoying the podcast because it helps it grow on that platform without that out of the way um i got a good topic today we're going to talk about piracy and why i think that we have a little bit ways to go when it comes to video game preservation uh it's gonna be i think an interesting topic that i've been thinking about for a while so before we get into that, I usually just go through game pickups and what the video uh, previously did and like what I'm working on in future projects. So with that out of the way, uh, here's the game pickups. I got a Game Genie for Game Boy in the box. Uh, it's missing, I believe, the official manual for it, uh, but it still has like the little itty bitty tiny manual that's in there. I got it from one of my Discord friends. He's clearing out his stuff and he's like, hey, like, is any of this stuff like valuable? Do you want any of it? And I was like, well, he had like some Super Nintendo uh, things and just not really like what I was like looking to get. So I did say that I wanted the Game Genie. So he sent that to me. I paid him 40 bucks for it, which is kind of this point because I, I collect game genies and I stopped like really hunting for them for the longest time back when they were like 15 to 20 bucks like in the box so I'm kind of a little miffed that I had to pay a little bit more for it but you know that's the way things go uh what I didn't pay for though is this it is a Ambernick RG351V if you're unfamiliar with these types of things basically what they are they're just emulation devices that um, have been really huge coming out of China and you know, there's so many of them I, I think maybe I'll just do a review uh, PK in the universe he gave it to me he's like yeah like the SD card stopped working or something so if you want to take a stab at it you know be my guest so I did and it works pretty good I might do a unscripted review on this um i'm just still kind of debating on like what i want to add for it because i haven't really like dove too much into it i have just been playing f-zero for the most part so it is what it is the other thing that i got was this atari controller replacement board and basically what this is is if you've ever played an atari like 2600 joystick you know like the classic controller you notice that it doesn't quite like it's not as effective and i had two of them and i was you know messing around with it and it would do the directions but the fire button didn't work and so i've been trying to like look for a replacement and you can use a sega genesis controller but i really like to use the official controllers when i play these games so um I kind of put a call out on Twitter. I was like, hey, does anybody like make like a mechanical like fire stick or something, you know, for the Atari 2600? And this one guy, his name is um, 
what the heck is his name? There's another guy, his name is Retro Game Boys, and he, what he does is, um, he makes, like, custom joysticks, and so he was like, hey, like, um, this command, Com Commodore Kaz, he makes these boards, and so, um, he, like, said, he's like, hey, DM me, I'll send you a couple just for you to test out, and then if you want to, like, if you could, like, do a review on the channel for him, so I think that's what I'm going to do. I have one, unfortunately, that the stick just doesn't work. Um, the fire, like, the actual, like, wire is shot, so it doesn't give, like, actual response towards it. But those are my pickups. Um, I have, like, you know, I don't really pick up any, like, real major things. I, I've kind of discussed this um, when it comes to... Uh, video game collecting you know, like I'm actually trying to trim down my collection in general so when I do find things I I find that like it's it's fun to kind of just make sure that those are actually going into the collection and not just kind of um, buying it for reviews or anything of that nature um, but you know it is what it is I'm still grateful that people are able to like send me stuff or you know give me stuff for the channel so I really appreciate it um, moving on to the last video's performance. So I haven't really posted anything on the main channel for a bit. Um, I'll cover that in just a little bit. I think what the last time it's been almost 20 days since my last uh, main channel video, but this podcast, uh, yesterday or the last week's episode, episode 12, uh, did pretty good. Um, it was about my uh, experience at a video game convention and selling games there uh, it got pretty decent a pretty decent reception and I think one it's because I did share it on my main channel and it was a subject that people were actually interested in so that's always good um, and you know get a little boost in subscribers I'm still trying to get to a hundred uh, so again if you haven't subscribed and you like what you're hearing and everything you know go ahead and you know subscribe at a hundred I get like a custom URL um, but yeah so what I'm actually like working on for the main channel is the PlayStation 3 Retronomics so I mentioned earlier on the last episode that I was working on an OUYA video and the OUYA video is filmed it's just I have to put it together and I'm kind of struggling a little bit with how to put it together to make it like my vision uh, of like what I really want and I um, it that that's one thing that I'm learning like I, I've gotten past the struggle part of it it's just a matter of like actually trying to like put it together so that way it can look the way that I at least close to what I want it to I think I get too wrapped up into my head about making it like this high production like uh, history channel type thing where it's like all put together all slick and then I have to remind myself that I am a one person team and I'm limited by my skills and my skills aren't as high as I think that they are so that is kind of been like a humbling experience to make sure that it's it's still okay to like make content that you might think isn't high quality but for a lot of people uh, it's just what they want to see so that's coming up but the retronomics video like I'm changing gears I, I mentioned it last time that uh, you know they're very easy to make it's just that for me they're kind of like boring um, when it comes to making them you know because I've streamlined the process to the point where um, the only thing that's really holding me back is like a computer that's fast enough to render each uh, retronomics price video um, each one right now takes about like two minutes to do um, which isn't that much in the grand scheme of things but when you're doing 25 of them it adds up so like when you cut down that time if I cut it down it should be a lot faster to keep moving and stuff because there's like still that two minute downtime where I'm like you know looking to somewhere else and sometimes I just kind of get distracted and then it turns into like 10 to 15 minutes per thing so I hopefully soon I will get 
a new computer uh, to get everything all set and done. Um, one of my friends, he was uh, giving away a a 1080 graphics card, and unfortunately, I wasn't paying attention too quick in the chat, and somebody else snagged it. So that would have been nice to at least have like my give my laptop a break and you know kind of act as a stopgap until I could build a new computer. But it is what it is. Um, I also am working on an unscripted video about the movie making nerd by James Rolfe. I just finished this book and I th have some thoughts on it. I'm not going to really get too much into like what I'm actually thinking about it, but I have an outline for the video and I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to make it an unscripted video on this channel and then like maybe kind of just like if it goes well do another book review because I have another book um, it's by Jeanette McCurdy it's called like I'm glad my mom died and it's about um, she Jeanette McCurdy used to be in like iCarly she used to be like a Nickelodeon star and um, it just kind of goes off into like how her mom you know treated her during that uh, set you know like the struggles of a former child actor and a whole bunch of other things so I think um, you know I'm excited to like give this a read next um, and you know if the movie making nerd video goes well um, maybe you guys would like some book reviews or something I don't know uh, just let me know in the comments down below but anyway gonna get into the main topic right now and this is it's kind of a I don't know. I don't think my particular opinion is controversial on this, but I know that piracy is in general controversial. So basically, um, I, I haven't really decided like what to call this, um, like what, what to actually name the episode, but I think like what I'm going to name it is like piracy can't solve the preservation problem. And I kind of want to like get ahead of myself on that because like it, it is one of those topics where um, everybody has an opinion and it seems to be it's like the nuance behind whether or not um, like around piracy is being lost. It's either you really are like a hundred percent all pirate, like where you like will even pirate like Nintendo Switch games, or you're like zero pirate where like you won't even download a random ROM like of little Samson because of some, you know, reason, which, you know, Hey, whatever your opinion is on piracy is fine with me. Um, I think the, uh, guns and roses said it best in their hit song. Welcome to the jungle. You can take anything that you want, but you better not take it from me because like, I think that's kind of like almost everybody's opinion on piracy. It's like, oh, they don't mind, like, you know, just downloading games and all this other stuff. But then they get, like, really defensive when, like, somebody else, like, steals their own uh, intellectual property um, when it comes to that. You know, like, oh, well, they're not making it illegal, you know, uh, readily available, so why not pirate it? And then, you know, so that my specific view on piracy is not i don't i don't really pirate um i'll go into the history of like my views on piracy in a little bit but like the too long didn't uh listen uh gist of it is that i am kind of in that boat where i don't if it's not available on modern platforms then i really don't see an issue with it especially when it's a company that just doesn't has no motivations to do it at all like you know it it if like a company like little samson for instance it's like that game is like in just limbo like it no one has laid like claim to it like taito who published it doesn't seem to like put it on any collections or anything like that so it's like do you really want to pay two thousand dollars for a physical cartridge just so that you can play the game like i think that's kind of like my philosophy on it um i have had a, a big long history of piracy because um well i'm 40 years old so i i did grow up during the time when 
the internet was still emerging and I remember the Napster days where you can download any song that you wanted for free and you know that kind of like played into it um where you know LimeWire and Kazaa and like all these other sites they came up and it just became like as long as you had like a faster a fast enough internet connection like nothing really stood between you and um and getting like what you wanted uh, it did take a while before like my internet connection never was really fast like i think i i never really got dsl like it was just like 56k like dial up and so i would always go to my friend dave's house because he had the dsl connection so he would download what like whatever i wanted uh, when it came to music and everything but when in 2001 i went to school at Iowa State. I went to college at Iowa State and it was, you know, before classes started. I think there's like, I think I got there like two weeks or something like that before class started. And I was setting up my computer in my, um, and I was one of the first people to uh, move into the dorms. And my RA was like, hey, like when you, um, uh, when you, you know, plug yourself into the internet and stuff, don't, go on to Kazaa and LimeWire because uh, that's kind of just like it's all slow. There's this thing it's called Chegg Search. And I was like, what's Chegg Search? And he's like, well, basically what happened was is that the entire network of Iowa State, like how many students that they had at the time, they're all interconnected via a network. And so if you shared your files, like say you shared your homework or something like that, you could technically like go down to the computer lab and instead of bringing like a flash drive or a disk, you can just like get into your own computer from wherever you were on the network and just drag and drop your files onto, you know, that work lab computer. Um, so what happened is and like if Chegg sounds familiar, Chegg is the same people who um, created the Chegg. Like, I think they do like quizzes, and now you can like rent books and do all this other stuff with them. Um, but it, they are from Iowa State, and like they've kind of memory hold what they've done specifically. Like, um, you know, like they, if you look at their Wikipedia page, it says like, Oh, they started out uh, making like a Craigslist style um, thing for um, Iowa State. And it's like, that's kind of true. They did have like the Chegg list, but the Chegg search was like their magnum opus. And basically like what it was is it's essentially Google for um, the Iowa State network. So say you wanted to see like you wanted to download a Michael Jackson album or whatever, like whatever album that you were thinking of and you find the song and then you can like look into the person's like library and it's like, Oh, they have the entire discography of Michael Jackson. So you would just literally just like um, drag and drop the stuff onto your computer and it would just be instantaneously. So it's think about 20 years ago, like back when the internet wasn't as like super fast um downloading music or whatever in like essentially as fast as you can move a file so basically what happened was is that eventually like people were posting like movies and like other things like dvd screeners and uh, all these other things and because you could also search like what was the popular file at the time too so it's like brand new movies were coming out on um, you know, it was just, it became like a piracy haven. Um, and it just, for the most part, like that's, you know, I had like tons and tons of stuff. I still have, um, my actual binder of burn CDs. Like I became like the guy who was able to like, know like what cracks were, how to like bypass like certain copyright protections like making cracked ISO so that way like when you downloaded um, when you burned a a game to a disc it wouldn't say like this is the wrong disc or something 
Um, so those were the things that I got like really into. And basically like what happened was, is that like, I think I can't find anything online. I was trying to like look up like, you know, news things, but basically what happened was, is that, um, check search eventually got like so big and popular that it became kind of like a race to see who could have like the most amount of data available. And so you would have like the top five like computers. And I think like the biggest data that they had at the time was like 600 gigs. And cause I mean, you got to remember too, it's like it's back in 2001 where and 2002 where um, data wasn't as, um, as cheap as it is now. So like, I think a, a one gigabyte hard drive at the time still costs like a hundred dollars or maybe it's a hundred gigs, a hundred gigs cost a hundred dollars. Um, yeah, it was about like a dollar a gig. Um, so you could, you could find like a hundred gigs hard drives for about, um, a hundred dollars. And that at the time was a lot of space um so yeah these people had like almost like a terabyte or something like that which again like was just crazy it's like i have a terabyte hard drive that's like a looks like a stick of gum now but so basically what happened was is that the fbi or somebody raided all of these big guys while they were at school um Again, like I haven't found any type of like actual news article about it because it's been so long. But basically the rumor was that there were people who instead of like posting like the hard drive stuff where it's like, you know, pirated movies, uh the rumor was is that somebody was putting up illegal uh fake ID software where you can create your own fake ID or there was um, some, some CP that was up there as well. Um, but again, like that's kind of unsubstantiated because I don't know, but basically there was a big fallout because what happened was is that these people who had like these huge hard drives, like they were at class and then they came back and their computer was gone and in the place was like this huge search warrant. Um, so basically all their computers got seized and what that did was it it spooked everybody like everybody turned off their file sharing services like everything kind of just like the air got sucked out of it um and eventually like it did kind of sort of come back it came back as an ftp uh, client where you had to actually show that you had a school id and then also um you know certain uh, servers were password protected and everything. So it became definitely not as like the wild west where you could just like download anything that you felt you had the need of. Um, but it was pretty interesting. Like even after all of that happened, I still kind of had a dabble in piracy. Um, like when halo two came out, my friends, they found it, um, like it got leaked two or three days before it was even released. So, um, as long as you had like a hacked Xbox, you could pretty much, we played Halo 2 like a couple of days before it even came out. Like, so it was still like piracy was still part of like my, uh, ethos at the time. Like I, I still have my modded Xbox and everything, but nowadays I don't really pirate modern stuff uh especially if it's available you know on sale uh so you know for instance you know i hear a lot of people say like you can just emulate the nintendo switch and get 4k you know 30 frames per second or whatever and you know that's how they play it um or like there's like always these rumors that like you you can just download these games without any issue and i don't I don't do that mainly because as I've gotten older, it's just one of those things where I'm not a hundred percent sure, um, how I feel about, you know, pirating modern things that are relatively available. If I have the money to buy it, I'll, and I feel that it's worth the money to buy it, I'll, I'll, I'll actually purchase it. 
but if I don't see that it's worth the money, then I just, I kind of, I just, I don't, I don't bother with it until like it comes up for sale. Like, I guess like it just boils down to the fact that I don't have the time to even like play these games. So downloading like an amass amount of things, especially when they're modern, just doesn't make as much sense as it did back in the day. Like even with like all the games that I downloaded, I think like I, I played them off and on. Like I didn't really like play them, uh, a lot to justify like it's kind of just like taking a sample and i think that's a lot of th instances where i hear when people you know that's the reason why they pirate they pirate as like a, a a demo and it's like well i'm pretty sure that like a handful of people have actually done that where they'll pirate the game and then they'll still pay for it afterwards but i think that's kind of one of those things where it's like you just have to take somebody's word for it and i don't a hundred percent think that that's the case um there's a lot of studies that have come out regarding piracy and a lot of surveys suggest that it wouldn't there's a lot of people who say like that piracy doesn't um affect sales because most of the people who pirate weren't going to buy it in the first place you can't really like assume a um a loss on a unrealized sale and so that's why whenever i hear that where they're like well i'm just sampling it and stuff is like i don't know like the convenience of pirating a game like once you've already got it you've uncracked it and everything you got the full game like the motivation to like actually purchase it after you've pirated it is is very very low and i think you know that it's just the way that like especially like when games go on sale so much too like on steam like as long as um you know just cause 3 came out and it was really funny because like the game was like just broken by drm uh, issues from the get-go and it was like I think a $60 game when it first came out and then it was almost like five dollars in like a couple of weeks so it's like five bucks like you know and I legally own the game um, and they fixed like some of their DRM issues and everything like that so I'm not telling you guys not to pirate but like that's kind of just like my my take on it and it's it's one of those things that over time I've looked at it at, in a different lens, um, which kind of segues into my next topic. And that's the video game history foundation and it's uh, pursuit of video game preservation. Um, that's usually what I've seen a lot of justification for piracy and basically video game history foundation. They posted a blog about this study and the study revealed that, about nine and ten nine out of every ten video games that have ever been made are not available on modern platforms like they're just gone <clears throat> and it's it's kind of like it's really interesting like you kind of think about that and you're like that's that's really interesting but at the same time it kind of makes sense right there is a ton of video games that are out there and like there's a whole bunch of things that are holding it up like there's certain games like Michael Jackson's Moonwalker that probably will never ever be re-released because you know the rights are all split and they're fragmented and everything so those are kind of difficult and then there's just instances where companies like they just deleted their source code like i think panzer dragoon saga is one of the most uh notorious ones where like sega can't just like or the company behind it can't just like release it because it's it's just gone um so they would either have to like build it from scratch or um you know go from go through great lengths to just like decompile it and then recompile it for modern platforms um you know and that's that's why piracy has been so desirable because it kind of just like it cuts through all of that like you don't need the source code to run 
Panzer Dragoon Saga on an emulator or anything. You just need the ISOs from a working disc. So, anyway, Video Game History Foundation, you know, when they're talking specifically about like to buy these games, which is which is kind of troubling, right? Twenty percent of games that are have ever been made are only available on modern platforms. If, like you can imagine, like movies in that same regard which is kind of the case but they kind of make a a good point where it's like imagine if titanic on the vhs was the only way that you could properly view that movie and you know like that you needed a vcr to do it and that's the only way like you know you kind of and that's kind of the same thing with like video game preservation in a a sense like if you really want to play little samson the way that it was meant to be played you do need a physical copy like you um and that that's like the legal sense of it so it it is kind of the same way with movies i don't know how many movies are actually just like lost to time but like that's kind of in the same a wheelhouse like i get kind of like the comparison that they're making but at the same time it's like there are a ton of movies that have just been lost to time like one of the famous ones is metropolis metropolis is a movie that is famously like known for being incomplete and they finally found missing footage enough to like build it to almost where it is uh, in its complete form so Movies and video games, they're kind of in place, but what sets movies apart from video games is that, you know, it's a lot easier to just take a digital representation of that movie and then put it up as long as you own the rights to it. We Studios own the rights to these movies. You know, it doesn't matter. Like, you don't have to get... You don't have to get the rights from the actors or anything like that in order to publish the movie. Like, everything's kind of, like, all set up from the top down. It's, you know, residuals go to the actor and the rest of the crew and everything. And the studio has the rights to the movie as a whole. And then, like, just the checks just roll out that way. So, but with video games, it's a lot more complicated because now it's like you have um, whoever the studio was that worked on it versus like the publisher and then like other coders and everything. The rights are all split up in different ways. Uh, so it becomes more and more complicated when it comes to legally uh, redistributing these games. So. Um, that's that's kind of the that's kind of the pickle that video game preservation gets into, and why you don't see like a lot of every single game be re released on modern platforms, and, you know, because it also does take some work too to put it on modern platforms too. You can't just like it's not just like taking a movie and like putting it up on a, like a TV set or a streaming service. Like I could theoretically um hook up with the proper cables i can hook up my disney plus subscription and play it on an old crt like it doesn't you know really matter but like if i'm gonna play apple games like i can only play them on like to recreate this this the actual experience i can only play them on like an actual apple computer like i could theoretically like emulate them but as far as like legally you know goes like i would have to track down the actual physical copy which is getting more and more difficult so you can kind of see where people would go in and say that piracy is the only solution to video game preservation and to an extent they're correct but i also do think that that reliance on piracy is a bit short-sighted so, um, like, for example, with this Apple computer, I have a floppy disk emulator with pretty much every single Apple II game that there is. Uh, if you kind of look on eBay for that type of medium, you know, most of the games, they came on a floppy disk. And 
it's it's a medium that is is not very um not very rigid i guess you should say like it, it's it's very easy to just like damage the disc like you know the the magnetic tape around here could be affected by uh, electromagnetic things like I could accidentally rub it up against a, a magnet or it could get like a static shock or it could just get bent or stepped on uh, there's a whole bunch of other things that go into actually like preserving it and in some cases like if it's been exposed to heat or um, any type of moisture or something it's very possible that even if you stored it away somewhere and it's never been used it could still not be usable and so like that's why I got a floppy disk emulator and basically the floppy disk emulator allows me to play every single thing that I want off of the software onto you know original hardware um, and those are the things that you know that's what I look for when I come to like actual accessibility but like I said it's really easy to say well then we should just pirate like it's it's fine like piracy is the thing that is um keeping game preservation alive and i think it's it's true now but it's unsustainable and like that's kind of the reason why i brought up how easy it was for me to pirate back in the day like where it, it was just as easy as moving files around it's getting very difficult to pirate stuff in general um as you probably are aware pri piracy is almost like everybody's like number one like video game company's number one priority to uh prevent basically you have things like always on internet con connectivity even for single player games you have um drm programs like de novo um, or whatever that thing is called that eats up like a whole bunch of resources and, you know, attempts to go in the back end and make sure that what you're doing is actually legit and it's very invasive. And, you know, there's all these other things that like companies are trying really, really hard to make sure that you are actually paying for the game. And <clears throat> in turn, it's kind of like diminished the actual experience of gaming. So like, for instance, you know, a lot of companies are going digital only and they are hoping on the fact that like when you do buy a game for $60 digitally, like you can't really sell that. You can't really trade it back. And then, so then that means too, is that if you are a person who is like a patient gamer who, like wants to buy used or when they're on sale like that becomes less and less likely so in turn like while companies are you know fighting this piracy thing they're also like ruining it for people who actually play by the rules in the same sense and this is all for people who would n to prevent people from pirating their things who would never bought it in the first place um you know there's been plenty of studies that say that you know that these these that pirates don't really affect the sales like if you were able to like 100 percent eliminate piracy like if you were somehow able to do it your sales wouldn't increase the way that they think that they're going to do so um but yeah like it's piracy is just demonized like nintendo was able to successfully successfully sue people into oblivion like they put them in jail like they're going to be paying money out to nintendo for the rest of their lives and these are all over like just roms like old roms that they're not even putting up regularly on their own platform for people to actually buy like that that's kind of the other bizarre thing it's like you know you see the nintendo switch online service and like just the trickling of games and stuff and it's just like well if you're going to just like annihilate these people for existing like that means that you probably have this stuff on the horizon you know I, I can go i can do an entire episode on like how nintendo is just dumb and i think maybe i'll just do that instead but like it's 
it's one of those things where when you successfully sue people and you actually like make it real where these people who have been running these pirate uh, rings are going to jail like basically what that means is that there's going to be less and less people willing to stick their neck out to actually um provide this service as you know goes and like also what happens too is that now these sites you know they get hit or something like that that fragments the entire archives so basically if you think that piracy is you know a way to actually like archive this stuff but you can't the archives like they split so like just imagine it's like okay one archive is for nintendo stuff but like that's becoming more and more difficult so it becomes like just sega with like nintendo buried into further and further into the like the far corners of the internet um it becomes a a big hurdle for video games in general so i think a lot of people they just say that you know oh just pirate like oh just just pirate is or emulate just it's it's fine don't worry about it um you know that's kind of the same issue with the 3ds eShop being taken down gerardo completionist he downloaded every single game but where are those games like are they available on an archive somewhere or is that just something that he did for the video game history foundation to keep like their own personal archives that you know no one can really play unless they go directly to the foundation and play it on site and i think that's that's really what i'm trying to get at here with piracy in general it's not it's not the catch-all solution that a lot of people think it is um you know same thing with archive.org like archive.org is a really great resource because you know websites get taken down all the time and you can go onto that site and find it it's kind of weird like every so often like i'll find like a youtube video um in my url that's like it's just been deleted and i'm like well what happened to, like what was the name of this video maybe i can find like a re-upload or something like that and it's like nope like archive.org never said what it was and all these other things and I think that's kind of the other issue that I'm raising too, is that piracy is really limited in how motivated a group is to actually pirate it. Um, you know, that's that's really the the biggest hurdle on there. Like I personally have benefited from piracy, but I'm not ripping. I don't have the material to actually like rip certain games and make them readily available for instance there's this game it's called um i think it's like alone in the dark or an it's called another world um another world for the jaguar and basically that's only physical only you can't find it digitally so your only best bet is to find it uh, find an actual physical copy and and play it like no one has made an actual rom of it because like in order to actually like do that you need a jaguar that can dump the roms and like in order to do that you have to make like you have to do some modifications to the jaguar that are pretty intense um and given like how rare jaguars are and stuff you, that's not really a um a thing that you want to like a you know ad address and stuff and so for then like this game it's a homebrew game it's just not it's only available physically and so that means that you know you just you either have to shell out i've paid two hundred dollars for mine uh some of the copies are going for like four or five hundred dollars um that's what you have to pay in order to get it like the person who created this they don't seem to have any intention of um of bringing it to a digital form even though there is now a, a, a jaguar game drive available so that you can play roms on your atari jaguar so 
you know, like I'm just I'm just saying like how limited piracy is compared to like what people think it is. It's not this magic bullet. Um, you know, and even then like with just ROMs and stuff, like piracy still can't preserve everything. Um, like say for instance like MMORPGs, like MMOs are one of these things where it's like they're their own little world and while you can make private servers to like recreate certain things there's still events in time that are just like lost like they're they can never happen again i used to play world of warcraft like a ton and you know there were definitely instances where like certain bugs would create like there was called the um i forgot like what it was called it was like a a bomb where it was it's um where you went into one of the instances the raid instances and basically the boss would make you the bomb and like you had to like run away from the group or else you would explode well there was a bug that if a hunter had a pet out you could dismiss the hunter or you can dismiss the pet while it had the bomb on and then you could just like not have it affect you and then you could like go to places like an auction house and then just bring out your pet and then the pet would explode and like it would kill everybody and like there's barely any like real like archive accessibility about like you i don't think that you could recreate that in a server much less there's like there has to be other people who talk about it as well so like it, it that's that's the other thing that piracy can't really like preserve it like it's it's based off of like what the specific archive is so if you archive only one version of a website or something before like after all of these other changes are done you can't go back and like peel back the layers of it um so that's that's kind of like um you know, that's that's another issue about like what piracy uh can like what the limits are and then also it's just it's just difficult to find stuff when it comes to piracy like i, I hear so many people like just be like well just you know just do it and it's just like i i have like unless you know specifically of like some random servers and everything it's not very accessible for new people um, especially when it becomes a topic that you could get your video taken down on YouTube. If like, for instance, I leak link to th stuff. Like when I usually talk about, um, you know, piracy specifically, like I kind of have to like go, well, you know, maybe if you search for something, you might find an archive of it. Wink, you know, I can't just like go like oh here's the file that i found like here is a um here's the link to where you can find it so like if you're completely new as you know as a 40 year old person who's been around since pretty much the internet existed um you know it's easy for me to just like dismiss it and just be like well i know exactly what i need to do to find it i also have like you know stuff already on my own hard drives and everything so it's really not a concern for me but for newer people who are coming about they just they don't have that access and you know it's and it's about like the obscure stuff too it's like I, i'm pretty sure that no one would have issues finding mario 3 or anything like that like i think um you know like if you if you were to um just like look for a rom or something like that it would you would find something on on google like almost instantaneously um but but when you're actually like looking for like some actual like obscure thing you might not find it like there's been um prototypes of games that only a few people had access to and for a very long time that's the only people who had access to that like they refused to dump it they still kind of have that mentality about it like that's kind of the appeal of finding a prototype is only 
one or two people have ever seen that before the rarity of it um you know those are the other things that you have to consider that you know it's it's not as wide it's not a wide open um world or anything like that that um you know people make it out to be um so which is kind of the reason why we really need to be pushing for the archive um archiving and the legal accessibility of games that video game history foundation and like these other video game preservation uh, initiatives are taking um because like if you do make it specifically a um a thing where you know they could actually like lobby and get the laws changed then accessibility goes up right it the motivation for these things becomes a little bit more um into the company's courts and stuff and they're they're willing to play ball instead of constantly just like knocking striking people down and sending people to jail and um you know doing all this other stuff um and and it's because the copyright system is broken uh and you know really like a game like little samson should be able to just be out in the wild um legally you know i know that a lot of companies they kind of treat piracy as big as like rolling through a stop sign or something like that but changing the laws to make it a little bit more um readily available would allow a lot of this stuff to be more out into the open and i i get like when money becomes like an issue on these things and like that's really like the the great barrier because you know if this was like open you know source and everything you still kind of have to um at least like that would bridge the gap like you still wouldn't see it like on modern platforms ever because like no one could actually like make money off of it but you know that's a whole nother set of problems that you know future generations can deal with but um you know that's like the legal accessibility you should be able to rent a a digital copy of a video game from a library to play it on your own like especially if it's something that's been out of print forever and ever like you know some of these games have been out of print for close to 40 years now and that is something to think about um but like i said i'm not saying that you shouldn't pirate things i you know i i get why people pirate i still you know i download certain games and i have um you know, I have flash carts for Virtual Boy. I have like this game is called Hyper Fighting. Um, you know that has that is a fan port of Street Fighter Two on the Virtual Boy, and like so, I get the reason why piracy and like certain things would exist because it allows things like Street Fighter Two to be ported to the Virtual Boy. But at the same time, though, um, you know, there should be a more communal push to give companies an incentive to grant more access to these titles because it is concerning that 20% of games are available online. And, or, yeah, and that the rest are just kind of like lost the thing. Because for me, and probably you, whoever's listening, it's, it's probably not a big deal. Because you can find, you know, the entire uh, Sega Genesis library. You can find the entire Super Nintendo library or uh, Sega Saturn or Nintendo 64 or GameCube or anything else up until very recently. And emulation kind of like solves that. But there are still gaps. It is still difficult to find. We still have data caps that Internet providers are pushing. Um, I don't know about you, but one time i did download the entire sega saturn library and i did it in like the middle of the month and sure enough like uh, comcast was like hey 
guess what? You've met your, your data cap for the month. So, or you're getting really close. And like, you know, I watch Netflix, I watch YouTube, I upload videos to YouTube and everything. So like I hit my cap. So that is another barrier that needs to be addressed. Like, you know, the future is digital and it's becoming more and more apparent that bandwidth is now becoming a premium again. Um, I don't know if you guys remember, but like back in the day, like if you wanted to host like a website, you had to pay for the traffic that came to your site. So like, say for instance, like you hosted just a random website and it like some aggregate site linked to it, like you could get charged a thousand dollars for just, you know, having that website get a whole bunch of pings and stuff too. So like we're now coming, we're now approaching it the, that again, where bandwidth is going to start costing us money to, to run these things again. Um, but kind of like talking around in circles, but that's kind of like how my view of piracy in regards to um, uh, in regards to video game preservation um, is um, uh, is supposed to um, go um, and like I hope that I'm adding something to that conversation because I think it's it's important to um, give that um, specific thing, um, uh, give that light and give add more conversation and stuff because I think again, like too many people are brushing it off as a a thing that's just not really that big of a deal. As soon as like more and more companies go digital, um, you're gonna see more and more rushes just like you saw with gerard the completionist about getting every single piece of digital media off of that site and that costs money like gerard has the means to do it um that's not necessary that other people did that so you're you're going to find it more and more difficult to track down a lot of this stuff and that's the reason why you need to we need to push to make sure that all of this stuff is preserved and accessible to people in a legal way that doesn't result in piracy. Um, so that's going to do it for this episode. I know that we're kind of like running a little bit close to an hour right now, but um, depending on like how many coughs I got rid of or something like that too. But let me know what you guys think down in the comments below about like what you think about piracy and um you know maybe i'll come i'll revisit this topic in another episode or something like that based off your comments um i know i kind of tried to have it a little bit condensed um you know i've been working on a an episode about video game preservation in general and it's just one of those topics that like it could become like a two hour video if I really push for it. So, um, let me know what you think. And then, um, you know, let's get this conversation going. But if you, again, made it this far into the episode, thanks so much for listening. Uh, if you're on Apple podcast or you're on Spotify, or if you're on YouTube, you know, make sure you subscribe where those platforms are, um, going. You can reach me on social media, uh, at snick I'm on everything. Um, Blue Sky, Threads, Twitter, and Instagram, all at Snicktendo. Um, I'm most active on Twitter, though. So if you want more um, things about that, you know, give me a follow there. But anyway, that is it. Um, thanks so much, and I'll see you next time.